to kick off the second component of the conference, the Sydney Mathematical Research Institute online component is Ben Andrews, and he's going to talk to us about limiting shapes for fully nonlinear curvature flows of convex hypersurfaces. Thanks, Ben. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Matt and John, for the invitation. Mostly what I'll be talking about is some, some open questions uh, about these uh, fully nonlinear curvature flows for hypersurfaces. Uh, let me just start by pointing out of the situation with the uh, well, really the fact that we have many, many, uh, you know, apparently well-behaved geometric flows for hypersurfaces. Um, so, what uh, by well-behaved here, I, I mostly mean that these are flows which are amenable to maximum principles, which means uh, you know they have they're really a parabolic system, but of a of a special form, a sort of diagonal uh, second-order term which means that you can apply maximum principles and geometric in the sense they're in, uh, invariant under all the relevant transformations. So reparameterizations and ambient isometries, uh, things like that. So uh, for my purposes, the general form will really be a, a flow of this kind. We'll take a family of embeddings from a manifold and a time interval into, let's say just for simplicity, Euclidean space. And they'll just move in the normal direction with the speed f, which is uh, an increasing symmetric function of the principal curvatures. Okay, and uh, so here the nu is the is a unit normal, and the principal curvatures are just the eigenvalues of the corresponding shape operator, which is just the the derivative of the normal thought of as a linear map on the tangent space. Um, so it's, yeah, essentially anything which is an increasing function gives you a, a nice geometric flow here, and that means we really have a an embarrassment of riches. Um, just to compare, in the in the case of a, a Romanian matrix, uh, the picture is completely different. The only flows that are known that have this property, where you have maximum principles, are the Ricci flow and the cross curvature flow, which only exists in three dimensions. Uh, in three dimensions, those are certainly the only ones, up to perhaps adding in dilations. Um, higher dimensions, I. I don't know of any others. It's conceivable there could be some hiding out there, but though, essentially there, there are very few flows of metrics where you have this nice property. Same with co high co-dimension submanifolds, right? As soon as you get beyond hypersurfaces into higher co-dimension submanifolds, there's really just the mean curvature flow. Uh, at least I don't know of any others, and at least uh, it, you can check, well, you can prove easily enough that at least in co-dimension two, uh, there aren't any other flows of this kind, just the mean curvature flow. Um, but for hypersurfaces, we've got this huge playground of things, which uh, in principle could be nice, well-behaved flows. Uh, so I just want to kind of summarize what we do know about these uh, and what are the sort of plausible conjectures about what we might expect for, for the way that these behave. Okay, so okay, so that's the condition. We need an increasing symmetric function. Let me just go through some of the examples. Of course, the, the uh, classical ones, the mean curvature flow, just the sum of the principal curvatures. Uh, Gauss curvature, the product of the principal curvatures, uh, elementary symmetric functions. Uh, there's a fairly big literature in the kind of fully nonlinear PDE direction where a lot of these kinds of equations have been considered. And uh, here we can just transplant a lot of those into this geometric flow setting. Uh, so the elementary symmetric functions, uh, just products of distinct K tuples of principal curvatures. Um, and well, these are elementary. That kind of means that all of the uh, okay. Well, in fact, that's maybe a useful way to think about it. All of the increasing symmetric functions of principal curvatures you can think of as increasing functions of the EKs as well. So these are somehow a, a basis for these uh, symmetric functions. And then we could take quotients of those. Those are also well behaved. If if k is bigger than l, then EK over EL. The ratio of, of symmetric functions is also a nicely behaved monotone function. Uh, and then once we have examples, we can take sums of them, products of them, powers of them, and we get more examples. And we can even take compositions of this kind. So if I take G, which is a monotone function of several arguments, then I can plug in monotone functions into each of those arguments and get new examples and so on. So this is ridiculously many of these things. Uh, so for simplicity, I'm mostly going to look at examples which are homogeneous. Uh, you can say some things about examples which are not homogeneous, but that's just uh, 
well, often there's not much motivation to do so. Uh, homogeneity kind of means that there is a well-defined notion of rescaling, uh, which takes solutions to solutions. So that's that's really the, the main reason which is a useful thing to consider. Uh, and okay, here these examples I should have I should have said before. I mean, the mean curvature flow makes sense for all hypersurfaces. Most of these other examples are not monotone unless I make the restriction that we're looking at convex hypersurfaces, which means the the principal curvature is lying in the positive cone. Uh, the different examples here actually make sense on slightly bigger cones, but uh, I'm, today I'm mostly going to look at the case of convex hypersurfaces, so uh, just things which are defined on the positive cone. Uh, so the model result here, of course, is Susskind's result for mean curvature flow, which says that, uh, or, or Gage Hamilton in the n equals one case, uh, says that convex hypersurfaces shrink to points and become round under the mean curvature flow. Uh, so the question is really for which hypersurface flows can we conclude a similar result and uh, for which uh, are there you know, different kinds of behavior that turn up. Um, okay, so the, this, this, the case where we know everything is curves in the plane. Um, and uh, at least in the homogeneous case, the, only, the examples are exactly these ones. The, the speed which you move is the curvature to the power alpha, so capital the alpha. Uh, so really the conclusion, um, well, okay, in, in general, you have a solution, a unique solution up to parameterization, starting with any convex cur uh, curve. I mean, this, you can reinterpret this as being anything which is the boundary of an open bounded convex set. So they can be a little bit non-smooth, sort of Lipschitz. Um, what you get is uh, if alpha is bigger than a third, then the curve shrinks to a point and becomes round. Um, so it shrinks to a point of finite time and the, the limiting shape is circular when you rescale. Um, just a comment there, if, if whenever you have alpha less than or equal to one, then the curve straight away becomes smooth. Even if I start with something which is, you know, perhaps could have corners and you know, uh, things like that, uh, becomes smooth and strictly convex. But for alpha bigger than one, then these solutions, you know, this result I stated here is a little bit oversimplifying. It, it shrinks to a point, but in general, the solutions actually know better than C2 alpha or C. In fact, given the alpha here, that's C2 plus one over alpha minus one. So you get lots of regularity if you're close to alpha equals one. But as alpha gets large, then in general, it's just only no more than hold a continuous second derivatives. Uh, but eventually it uh, has to become strictly convex because it converts to a sphere, to a circle. And so it becomes smooth also once that happens. Uh, so it's smooth and strictly convex near the final time. Uh, okay, so there's this critical number a third and sort of the reason for that turning up is that when you have flow by uh, alpha uh, with, with K to the one third, then that actually corresponds to a, a really natural uh, geometric flow in affine geometry. Um, so-called affine normal flow. Uh, and in that case, uh, well, so Hong Su Che talked about this uh, in his talk, but uh, because it's affine invariant, you necessarily get more than just the shrinking circles. You can apply your affine transformation and get shrinking uh, ellipses. Uh, and so really the general statement has to allow that possibility. And that's, that's what uh, turns up. Any embedded closed convex curve shrinks to a point in finite time and the limiting shape after rescaling is an ellipse. Um, okay, uh, and then for small alpha, essentially there's not enough uh, diffusion to to control the shape in finite uh, as the as the thing uh, shrinks to a point. You still get converged to a point in finite time, but the sort of generic situation is that the isoparametric ratio becomes unbounded. So you do have other uh, self-similar solutions, including of course the, the shrinking circle. Uh, and other examples which are completely classified, but all of those are unstable. Uh, so you can just perturb away and get this uh, generic uh, sort of non-convergence result for the rescalings. Uh, okay, so the proof here, um, in the case of curves, the, the kind of the, the crucial element in getting this convergence to, to circles or you know, other things is, is essentially variational. Uh, for these curve flows, you, you do have nice monotone entropies. Um, in fact, there's two families which I'll write down here. So uh, there's the one on the left, which I'm calling E alpha. Um, this I'm calling a Hamilton type entropy. 
Um, so this was you know, one of the tools that was used in the paper by Gage and Hamilton uh, in the treatment of the convex curve shortening flow. Uh, that's the second expression here when alpha equals one. Uh, so he looked at integral of k log k on the curve. Uh, so if you, in fact, yeah, I mean, to state it precisely, that that integral, uh, when you rescale to to fixed area, is monotone. Okay, and there's a corresponding quantity for for other alpha as well. So these are the sort of curvature based entropies, and they're a nice monotone family. So these are Hamilton type entropies, and then there's the so-called fiery entropies are actually much older. Uh, they go back to 1974 from uh, Fiery's paper on, on uh, shapes of rolling stones, which is actually a Gauss curvature flow. Um, he didn't do it for, you know, explicitly for curves, but he in, in, really in, I guess he was thinking about uh, surfaces in R3, but, but his expression I still makes sense for, for these flows. Um, so uh, for the Gauss curvature flow, then the entropy is essentially this integral over the circle of directions, the um, circle of normal directions of the log of the support function. So u here is the support function of the complex curve uh, integrated on the circle with respect to the angle argument. And again, rescaled to fixed area, essentially. So that's what this quantity does. Uh, so these are nice monotone things. So the, the, uh, there, there are advantages to each of these. So the, the Hamilton entropies depend on curvature, and so they're translation invariant. Uh, so they're, in that sense, they're a little bit nicer. They sort of pick up the, sh the shape of the thing without having to worry about you know, moving to the final point or anything like that. They're not, they're not point dependent, um, but they depend on curvature. So they're in some sense less continuous. Um, the fiery entropies depend on, on support functions. So they're, they have nice continuity properties. They're, con they're continuous with respect to house of convergence of convex sets, for example, but they do depend on your choice of origin. So uh, that makes them perhaps a little bit harder to handle. So they're different. Uh, these are both used in, in different settings in, in useful ways. But yeah, so the, uh, that's the crucial step is here. Uh, the, the first step is somehow to find these variational quantities. The, you can check that the evolution of these, these, these are strictly monotone unless uh, you're on a soliton, so a self-similar solution. And so you can conclude from that that the curves uh, have to converge to solitons uh, for alpha bigger than a third, then control on, let's say the Hamilton entropy implies a diameter bound, geometric bounds. And so you get converged to something and the monotonous, the entropy says that uh, that something has to be a soliton, right? And so then the final step is, is just classifying the solitons. In this case, it's a curve in the plane, the soliton equation is essentially an ODE. So you can just uh, understand the ODE and work out what the solitons are. Uh, and they're just circles in the embedded case. Okay, so high dimensions. And is so, there any way to actually kind of generate these quantities, or are they just sort of things that you just happen to find randomly, um, or you just guess? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's there's a long story behind each of these, right? Uh, so the for, okay, so it, the first appearance of this in the in the sort of hypersurface setting is the curve shortening flow, which Gage and Hamilton found. So yeah, and the the argument there in the original paper, and also for the Gauss curvature flows, which was by Hamilton and Chow, um, they had a kind of bizarre argument, uh, kind of using the fact that it contracts to a point and, and they get a, you know, sort of some kind of weird differential in the quality for, the, for, the, uh, for this, which gives you a contradiction if this is not monotone. Um, that only works in the alpha equals one case. In the alpha not equal to one, um, yeah, well, yeah, I guess I was just banging my head against the wall and found it, but it, that you have to use a, a, a Brumikovsky theorem to prove these. Um, um, and yeah, it's just finding something that, that seems plausible. The, the, uh, the fiery ones are much more direct. You can kind of see much more clearly how those turn up. So the, um, this, you can, yeah, these you can sort of construct if you're looking for a variational formulation for the soliton equation. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, because the thing on the right gives you a power of support function and the variation of the area gives you essentially Gauss curvature. Right? Uh, and so the combination of, it, of or enclosed volume and these integrals of powers of, of uh, support function can, if you cook them in the, up in the right way, give you essentially the solid equation as the euler Lagrange equation. So uh, yeah, these are easier. The, the Hamilton ones are a bit trickier to find. But that's a, a very good question. I mean, that's as, that's one of the sort of open questions. Uh, one of the stumbling blocks in dealing with other flows is exactly that, finding these monotone quantities. Um, okay, so higher dimension. So th there is the one case where we do know quite a lot is when the flow is homogeneous degree one. Okay, and so this goes back a long way. There are a, lot, a whole bunch of results, which I'm just gonna put together into one theorem. Um, suppose your speed function is okay so it's an elementary it's a sorry it's a symmetric function of the principal curvatures so i'm just going to little little f of kappa one to kappa n so little f is supposed to be smooth homogeneous degree one symmetric function defined on a positive cone and strictly monotone meaning that the the f dot i which which is supposed to be the derivative of f with respect to kappa i is strictly positive at each point on the positive cone okay and then there are various situations when this works. If n equals two, then I don't need any more conditions, right? Any any function of that kind will work. Uh, in higher dimensions, then it's enough to take f to be a convex function or a concave function, which is zero on the boundary of the positive cone, or a function which is concave and for which the dual function is also concave. So the dual function is this strange looking thing where uh, it's, so I'm looking up a new function, which is the old function of the reciprocals of the arguments, and then take the reciprocal of the result. So this, this takes a homogeneous degree one function, gives you a new one. Uh, but it, it, here, really what's happening is you, the f uh, is a function of the principal curvatures. The f star is in some ways thinking of that as instead a function of the principal radii. So that's the kind of the duality here. Um, okay. So uh, or um, if this dual function is concave and zero on the boundary of the positive cone. So under all of those situations, then uh, convex hypersurfaces moving with that speed will contract to round points. So the homogeneous degree one case is, is really quite nice. So in, essentially in all these cases, you get really the analog of, of Huskin's theorem. Yeah. Convex hypersurfaces can become round, it converts to spheres, modular scaling. Um, okay, so. Uh, I mean, that's Huskin's, essentially the argument here is Huskin's argument for the mean curvature flow. Uh, ben Chow pushed that through for the, the, the nth root of Gauss curvature and the rest are, are various bits, some from my thesis, some from later papers. Uh, the last one was a paper with James McCoy and, and Cheng Yu, um, this F star concave and zero on the boundary. Um, and yeah, so there's, I mean, the, the, the differences between these are, uh, uh, mostly technical to do dealing with the, some of the terms that term. I'll, I'll talk about a bit of that in, in a minute. So examples, mean curvature flow, um, that fits into, let's say the F convex part, I guess it's linear, so convex. Uh, EK to the one over K. So the, the K root of the K elementary symmetric function is, uh, let's see, it's uh, it's not convex. It's not, it uh, if, if K equals N, then it's concave and zero on the boundary. For any k, it's concave, but in general, not zero on the boundary, but it is concave and inverse concave. So this is covered by part four here. Um, we can also take ratios uh, of elementary symmetric functions to the power to make it homogeneous degree one. Those are all fit into this, this part four here. So they're, they're concave and inverse concave. Oh, sorry, inverse concave. I'm just shorthand for this statement that the dual function is concave. Uh, also, these power means, these are just the, the means of rth powers uh, and then take the rth root. So it give you something that's homogeneous degree one. These are all covered by this result as well. Uh, so these, uh, let's see, uh, these are really form a continuous family for all r in the real numbers. They converge to the minimum principal curvature as r goes to mi minus infinity, maximum principal curvature as r goes to plus infinity, and when r equals zero, this is really just the Gauss, the nth root of Gauss curvature. Uh, 
the geometric mean. Um, and then I can take geometric combinations. So things like square root of mean curvature times fourth root of Gauss curvature, you know, so on, so on. Those would all fit into this result. Um, the proof is essentially the same with minor variations. Well, not minor variations. I mean, the, the big technical variations, but the, the strategy, the proof is similar in all these cases. The idea is to look at uh, quantities which are homogeneous degree zero in the principal curvatures and control those. So the uh, what we know under these flows is that the speed itself, the F actually satisfies quite a nice heat type you know, a parabolic equation. So df dt would be uh, this elliptic operator. The F dots here are the derivatives of F with respect to the components of second fundamental form. So A here is a second fundamental form. Uh, so in other words, it's just defined by this, this equation here. So if I differentiate F evaluated along a, a line of, uh, of uh, matrices, A plus S times B, then this is F dot at A applied to B. So that gives me this, this uh, form F dot. Uh, the, monot 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 the monotone condition on F really says that this F dot is positive definite. Okay, so then I get a positive definite operator, uh, an elliptic operator here on the left, and just one extra term, which is uh, you know, positive for all these things. Um, in the homogeneous degree one case, then the really nice thing is that the evolution of second fundamental form looks rather similar. So I get, again, the leading term is the same elliptic operator. I get the zero order term, you know, there's the one that depends just on curvature, really has exactly the same form. So instead of f times f dot of a squared, I get a times f dot of a squared. So we have the same linear term, if you like, the same linear equation. The only extra term I get comes from the nonlinearity. This is the second derivatives of f. Uh, so this involves the gradients of second, fund uh, second uh, fundamental form. That's in general that this is the one which causes most of the headaches and why there's different proofs in all those various cases. Uh, if I, right, so the idea is that the, the assumptions on F allow you to control that, that extra term. Uh, let me just look at the simplest case, which was where F is convex, then this F double dot will be positive or non negative at least. And so if you look at the evolution of the ratio of second fundamental form to the speed, then that will satisfy a nice equation. These, these two linear terms will just cancel and I'll get an equation where you can apply a nice maximum principle. So the DDT of, of A over F as a matrix equation is greater than or equal to this uh, elliptic operator plus a gradient term. And so you can conclude from a, you know, two, a tensor maximum principle that the smallest eigenvalues non-decreasing. Okay, so that case is very simple. Um, that means, let's say that says that the uh, minimum principal curvature is bigger than uh, a multiple of F. If F is convex, then F is comparable to the maximum principal curvature. So you get a really a, a bound on the ratio of, of principal curvatures point wise. Uh, and that's enough to control the geometry. If you have a, a hypersurface with, with bounds on kappa max to kappa min at each point, then that gives you a global bound on ratio of circumradius to in radius. And so you really have control in the convex setting, this is this is really all you need. It controls the geometry. Um, okay, and, and what's more, the strong mass of principle tells you that this this the kappa mean over f, the minimum of that of the hypersurface is actually strictly increasing unless it's a sphere. And so it's it's easy to see from that that the, the limit of rescalings has to be a sphere. Uh, okay, the other cases, the various situations that I described here become progressively more complicated here, but. Uh, the basic strategy is the same. The difficulty is in exactly in handling that uh, the effects of this second derivative term. Okay, um, what happens when we go away from homogeneous degree one? So um, we saw from the curve case that you'd probably expect. Well, in the curve case, we got nice behavior for large alpha, and you know, not not so nice behavior in the sense of not converging to circles uh, for small alpha. Uh, it seems plausible would expect a similar sort of thing. And in fact, if you look at the linearization of the shrinking circle solution, for example, the shrinking sphere solution, uh, that is certainly true. You get, you get linear stability for la I mean, alpha bigger than a certain number, depending on, uh, well, not depending on anything very much, uh, bigger than one over uh, n over n plus two, and uh, linear instability of alpha is less than that number. Um, if I try to use, similar methods to the homogeneous degree one case, which is just controlling 
curvature quantities using the maximum principle, then there's a few cases where that works. Uh, in particular, the Gauss curvature flow in two dimensions, you can control the difference between uh, the two principal curvatures at, e at each point, then that's non-increasing. The maximum of that over the surface is non-increasing. And that's, uh, well, you know, it's a nice strong control on the surface. It's much stronger than the bound on the ratio. So it, it certainly tells you that the convex surfaces converge to round points. Uh, so that was work from way back on the fiery conjecture. And there's various things which use similar sort of strategy is really, uh, this comes down to finding the right curvature quantity to control, and then you know just doing the hard work to show that the 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 terms that you get in the evolution equation behave nicely. So, for example, powers of of mean curvature. Felix did that uh, at least. You know, there's a range of of powers of of mean curvature where you can use this sort of method to to get good control on the curvature. Um, Oliver Schnurer did this for flow by. Uh, uh, a, uh, the length of second fundamental form squared. Um, uh, Xu Zhong Chen and I extended the, the, the methods for the, from the fiery conjecture to other powers of Gauss curvature, uh, at least. So it basically works beautifully, but only for powers between a half, which is the, sorry, yeah, this is not quite right. Um, oh yeah, K to the alpha. So this is a bit confusing because alpha is then not the degree of homogeneity in the principal curvatures anymore. Uh, yeah, so k to the alpha, where alpha is between a half and one, which means homogeneity, homogeneity between one and two. Yeah. Uh, and there's one example which we found, it, which we've never actually written down, but which is kind of interesting only because it applies for all alpha. Uh, and that is the, the flow by the sum of the alpha powers of the principal curvatures. So you can show that for any alpha bigger than one, then uh, this, these will converge to a circle, oh, sorry, a sphere. Um, that's a kind of, it's a gruesome computation, which is why we've never written it down. Uh, but it's nice to know that there is at least some example where these sort of pointwise curvature methods can tell you something useful. Uh, I've never been able to get this sort of method to work in higher dimensions. Uh, you know, there could be something there, but it's, it seems like, well, and also looking at these examples here, these methods don't seem to be, uh, to plausibly apply for all alpha, for example, in general. Uh, these just, there don't seem to be any uh, estimates which are just curvature dependent, which would give you control on Gauss curvature flows for all alpha in higher dimensions, or even in two dimensions. Um, however, the Gauss curvature flow- Sorry, Ben, is that is the problem there that again with the second derivatives of F? The, yeah, essentially, yes, right. Um, yeah. You can write down plenty of nice quantities where the the evolution of the quantity is well behaved, except for the terms which involve the gradients of, curve, of second fundamental form. Yeah, okay. and those are those are the ones that cause all that cause all the headaches. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so the one sort of success story in all this is Gauss curvature flows, right? So let me talk about those. Um, essentially, this is the one case where the the story from the curves in the plane translates successfully to higher dimensions. So the theorem is this, this is a compilation of many people's work. Um, if alpha is, so here alpha is the degree of homogeneity in the principal curvature. So we're looking at speed, Gauss curvature to the power alpha over n, in other words. So the Gauss curvature itself is homogeneous degree n. Uh, okay, so then, yeah, that's the statement. If alpha is bigger than n over n plus two, then convex hypersurfaces contract to round points. If alpha is equal to that critical exponent, this is the affine normal flow. Um, so again, uh, Hong Su Che talked about this uh, in his talk a little bit. Uh, so the same thing holds in the sense we get contraction to points, but the limits could then be ellipsoidal. Uh, and if alpha is less than n over n plus two, then there's sort of a gener genericity result. Uh, we know at least that all of the uh, antipodally symmetric solitons are unstable. So you get a, this kind of generic non-convergence result. And if you start with a, a hypersurface, which is antipodally symmetric, that means that uh, you generically don't uh, get convergence to a soliton. You get instead the, the uh, isoparametric ratio blow up. Uh, so it shrinks to point, but there's no good limiting shape, if you like. 
Uh, okay, yeah, so here's the what I, most of what I just said. If the case alpha equals n, n over n plus two is the affine normal flow, that's my we'll go back to 1996. Um, so in these cases, you again have entropy functionals, so monotone functionals, in fact, exactly the same two families together with so there's the, the, uh, the Hamilton type entropies and the fiery type entropies. So I use the Hamilton type, the sort of curvature based integrals of Gauss curvature essentially to control. Uh, you know, the sort of geometry of these things and to show they become self-similar. Uh, there's a regularity issue if alpha is bigger than one, uh, but uh, Pong Fei Guan, which means you, you know, you can sort of, in alpha bigger than one, you could include some kind of convergence to a generalized soliton, but it may be non-smooth non and non-strictly convex. Um, but then Pong Fei Guan and Lei Ni uh, show that using the fiery entropy, you can, you can uh, do, finish that story for alpha equals n. So alpha equals n, they show that you get convergence to a smooth, strictly convex soliton. And then I joined together with them and we extended that to all the alpha bigger than, you know, the, the uh, supercritical, if you like, the alpha bigger than the affine case. Uh, my original proof for the affine flow used a third derivative estimate. So it used an estimate on the so-called cubic ground form, which is some affine invariant quantity involving gradients of second fundamental form. Um, this is really inspired by the one Calabi used for the affine hypersphere problem, which is a corresponding elliptic problem. Um, so, I mean, that's a beautiful estimate. It gives you a, a, an amazingly strong result, but the, the result can actually be proved mostly variationally. So just using the, the entropy, um, um, so, you get convergence. So the nice thing is here, you can always do affine corrections to, to control the geometry. Um, so you can get convergence modulo affine transformations to a soliton. And the solitons for this flow are exactly the affine hyperspheres, which are what Calabi studies. So he proved that they're all ellipsoids. So that would give you convergence modulo affine transformations and rescalings to an ellipsoid uh, without using the third derivative estimate or without directly using it. Um, yeah. Okay. So finally, um, the the final step in the story here is classifying the the solitons, and that was done uh, first by by, uh, by Hongsu and and uh, Toti uh, for a sort of limited range of alpha, and then together with uh, Simon Brendler for all the for alpha greater than or equal to n, one, n over n plus two. So uh, basically the the situation is, yeah, the, the new result is that for alpha bigger than n over n plus two, the only solitons are spheres. So that completes the, the proof of this theorem. Um, I mean, I've been slightly sloppy here. So uh, when I say convex hypersurface can vector around points, again, uh, here we're really assuming that the initial hypersurface is smooth and strictly convex. Uh, and there are still some questions around what happens if you don't assume that, if you have only a weakly convex initial hypersurface, for example. Uh, in n equals two, it's known that you still get this convergence to spheres. High, higher n, I don't know how to do that yet. So it's perhaps an interesting open question, which I wasn't intending to talk about today, but uh, there are some still some questions there. So I, I want to point out here that the the uh, Brendler chain Daskalopoulos estimate is not at all variational. Right? This is purely a maximum principle argument. Uh, it uses the maximum principle applied to, well, it's so it's, in various situations, either the trace or the maximum eigenvalue of this matrix. So you look at the speed, k to the alpha over n, times the inverse of second fundamental form, uh, and then minus a suitable constant depending on alpha times the radius squared times the metric. So that uh, that matrix, or the, you know, the, the trace or the maximum eigenvalue satisfies a nice uh, maximum principle estimate, which gives you that the uh, spherical limit. Um, yeah, so it uses the, the soliton equation uh, to give a nice uh, equation for that quantity here. So in the case when alpha equals uh, one, right, which is the homogeneous one degree one case, then this second term drops away. And this is exactly the curvature pinching estimate uh, that we used in the homogeneous degree one case. I mean, it's, this is not precisely the estimate that Ben Chow used, but it's, you know, there are, many variations you could use. Essentially, it's a homogeneous degree zero function of the principal curvatures, just as we were talking about. 
Sorry, Ben, is H the second fundamental form here? Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit sloppy here. I called it A before and now it's H. Yeah, but this is second fundamental form, yeah. So the uh, so speed times inverse of second fundamental form is now homogeneous degree zero if alpha equals one, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's that this, if you like the steps are the same as in the curve case. So there's one step which gives you convergence for soliton. The second step is to classify the solitons. And, and the interesting thing here is that the, the proof to classify the solitons is sort of reminiscent of the argument which was used for uh, you know, using pointwise curvature pinching essentially in the uh, homogeneous degree one case. So I'll come back to that a little later. All right, so uh, the question, really the, over, the, the big question which I wanna get at is what can we hope for in these flows? What is a reasonable sort of conjecture about what, what could happen under these flows? Um, so I said that the Gauss curvature flow case combines a variational argument with the classification of solitons uh, using the, the BCD argument, right? Uh, if I want to apply that sort of strategy to other flows, then we need to, first of all, have you know, mono entropies or monotone functionals, which would give us solitons as critical points. So the first question is, for, uh, what flows do we know that have monotone functionals? Uh, the only ones that I know of are the following. So the speed is a ratio, okay, it's, well, this is essentially Gauss curvature divided by K elementary symmetric function to a power. Okay, so, uh, and then K can be zero up to N minus one. Uh, the k equals zero is the Gauss curvature flows, which we just looked at. Um, the other example of these, which has been considered quite a bit, is the k equals n minus one. These are powers of the so-called harmonic mean curvature. So en, en over en minus one is the harmonic mean curvature h minus one. So this is just the the uh, reciprocal of the average over the reciprocals of the principal curvatures. Uh, so this is actually being it's one of the flows which has been used sorry, quite often uh, over the years. In particular, it's one of the flows which behaves nicely in Romanian backgrounds. So it's the main reason it has been used. Um, but yeah, it has this nice entropy function. Is um, that again from the Brun Minkowski? It's, uh, yeah, not quite Brun Minkowski, but a generalization of Brun Minkowski. It's from the Alexander Fenchel inequalities, gives a generalization of Brun Minkowski in the case of convex hypothesis. So the proof is, is sort of similar. Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of convex uh, uh, coming from, yeah, ideas coming from convex geometry, really. So Brumikovsky, Alexander Fenchel inequalities and so on, gives you these uh, monotone functionals. Um, so I don't know any monotone functionals that apply for other flows. That's really one of the, one of the questions which I want to get to. Um, so these flows really have the same types, uh, exactly the same types of of uh, entropies. There's the Hamilton type entropy, which is some kind of integral of the speed, a power of the speed uh, over the sphere. And there's fiery type entropies, which are integrals of powers of the support function. Uh, and in fact, there's another sort of, a, there's a family of, of monotone functionals which interpolate between these. Um, okay, so what do we know um, about these flows? Um, when alpha is one, well, these are in particular ratios of elementary symmetric functions. And so we know that these contract uh, smooth, strictly convex hypothesis to points in, in the uh, homogeneous degree one case. Uh, but unfortunately for any other alpha, there are counterexamples, right? So you, you, don't, you definitely don't get a statement as clean as in the gauss curvature flow case. It just doesn't happen. So this is work again, going back quite a few years now by James McCoy, uh, Jangyu and I. Um, so we constructed examples which show that you can start with a smooth, strictly convex hypersurface, and then it can develop curvature singularities before the hypersurface shrinks to a point. Okay, this is, in fact, this happens for any flow by F, which is homogeneous degree alpha, if the dual functional function F star is not zero on the boundary of the positive cone. Okay. Um, so in particular, this includes the entropy flows, except for the Gauss curvature flows, right? If a K is not zero, then the dual function is not zero on some of the faces of the positive cone. Okay, so that what happens here is something like this. You could start with a convex hypersurface, which has, uh, in this case, it can be actually symmetric. These examples we construct are actually symmetric. 
and they have something like a ridge of high curvature around, you know, maybe the equator or some, you know, some ridge of high curvature here. And then if you evolve for a short time, well, this picture is going to look a little strange. Uh, it becomes something like this. So obviously this is not a convex hypersurface anymore, but what's happening here is we're looking at the evolution of the support function. So in other words, we're parameterizing on the unit sphere and we're thinking of this flow of the hypersurface, you know, the high, a convex hypersurface can be uh, essentially identified or, you know, is in one to one correspondence with its support function. So it's enough to, to understand how the support function evolves. Here, the support function evolves by a kind of a, a Hessian type equation, right? Uh, the, so in this situation, what happens is the support function actually stays perfectly smooth and is actually a classical solution of the corresponding uh, PDE uh, for the support function, which, which comes from the flow. The problem is that the, the uh, principal radii can become negative. Right. So essentially, there's a matrix, uh, essentially, the, which is constructed from the Hessian of the support function, uh, the eigenvalues of which are the principal radii. So these are one over the principal curvatures. So here, the, the support function can stay smooth, the Hessian will stay bounded, but this, this Hessian matrix can have negative eigenvalues, which means some of the principal radii go through infinity, if you like. So then after, afterwards, the embedding it somehow develops horns and things. So it's no, no longer actually an embedding. But uh, yeah, so it's a classical solution for the support function, but it's highly singular for the, for the hypersurface. Okay, so that rules out uh, lots of examples of flows, including, unfortunately, all of these entropy flows that we have. So uh, things don't look too good in a way. So the only candidates for flows we have where we do know are monoclonal functional, we have counter examples that show that you cannot expect smooth convergence to a round point. Okay, so I'd like to uh, sort of end up with a couple of conjectures. So this, really there's two main conjectures that I wanna make here. Um, the first one is that for the entropy flows, there are generalized solutions, which will stay uh, convex bodies. Okay, the, uh, presumably non-smooth convex bodies. Um, you can construct generalized solutions easily enough, but the difficult part is to argue that the entropy still remains monotone on those generalized solutions. Okay. Um, so if you can do that, then you would get the generalized. So it's, I think, not too hard to show the generalized solution would shrink to a point, and the entropy would show that it would be asymptotic to a possibly non smooth soliton. Right. Um, I should point out also that there do exist non-smooth generalized solitons for all of those flows. Um, so let's see, I mean, this goes, this is an old observation of Hamilton. Um, he observed that uh, for the harmonic mean curvature flow of a surface in R3, a shrinking flat disk is a soliton in some, in a sort of generalized sense, in a barrier sense. Um, so yeah, you can start with, with a hypersurface which is flattened onto a disk and then that will just evolve by shrinking. Um, and for all of these other entropy flows, there is you know, suitable lower dimensional disks, uh, shrinking disks, which are in sense generalized solitons for these flows. Uh, more generally, if I, if, okay, let's, let's stick to um, the R3 case. Uh, if you take a convex subset, which is lies in a plane, then that will be a generalized barrier solution for this alpha power of harmonic mean curvature, exactly when the boundary curve evolves by the alpha power of the curvature as, as, a, as a curve evolution. So uh, in particular, you'd have you know, correspondence then with the story we just had about the curve case. You get all these, for example, shrinking ellipses in various cases, so on, as, as sort of singular solitons for these high dimensional flows. Uh, in fact, I mean, one of the interesting things to think about here is the small alpha, the entropy of this collapsed shrinking disk is, uh, sorry, I should say, is greater than that of the shrinking sphere, yeah, which means that uh, you might expect that solutions which start near the sphere would then move towards the, would collapse onto the lower dimensional disk in these situations. So there should be interesting sort of ancient solutions interpolating between starting from the sphere and ending up at this collapsed disk, for example. Um, 
the complication again here is how the the non-smoothness comes into that picture. It's not quite clear how that would interfere with our argument. Well, that's related to this question about whether the fire, whether the entropies are still monotone under these generalized flows. Um, for a large alpha, it seems that the the uh, these collapsed ones are unstable. So we shouldn't actually get those uh, turning up as limits of smooth, strictly convex things. All right, so that's one conjecture. And that, um, yeah, I mean, so that, that really the question here is about how to cook up the right kind of generalized solution. It has to be something a little bit more general than the uh, level set flow. You can cook up a, a level set flow solution, but that would not, not allow generalized solutions in the sense of these shrinking collapse disks here. Those are not really level set solutions. They are barrier solutions. So that's probably the right way to think about those. Um, OK, so conjecture two, um, the counter examples that I mentioned before kind of rule out, uh, for example, out of all of the flows by quotients of elementary symmetric function, for example, which is one natural class, the only ones that still survive that process are uh, flows by powers of, of the elementary symmetric function as a principal curvature. Okay. Uh, more generally, the, the sort of natural class that comes out are flows which where the speed is homogeneous degree alpha. So I'm thinking of it as now an alpha power of something which homogeneous degree one. And so then the dual function of F, the homogeneous degree one thing is concave and zero on the boundary of the positive current. Okay. So that would include exactly the, the uh, flows by powers of elementary symmetric functions, but you know a much a bigger example, uh, a much bigger class of examples than that. So the conjecture is that those would all give smooth convergence to round points for alpha bigger than one. Yeah, so it includes those ones. Uh, the contraction of points actually we know, we've known for a long time. This is, goes back to Ching Han in the uh, in the 1990s. Um, we also know that smooth strictly convex solitons are spheres okay this is essentially a, a, using the the bcd arguments uh, the same arguments essentially work for a much wider class of flows for the same reason that the in the homogeneous degree one flows we could do we could deal with many different classes of homogeneous, homogeneous degree one examples by just finding the right sort of curvature quantity to apply it to here the same thing applies essentially the same kinds of curvature quantities uh, uh, then with a suitable extra term involving the radius squared, give you well-behaved quantities here. Um, so the missing ingredient is uh, we know what the solitons are. We just don't. We have no reason to think that things should become solitons. So we don't have any monotone quantities that that tell you the limits of solitons and things like that. So that's that's what we're missing here. So um, okay. So the strategies for the conjecture. I mean, the the first strategy would be actually to try to reformulate the BCD estimate. So the curious thing about the BCD estimate is that it applies for solitons, but there's no corresponding estimate for the flow. And it's very tempting to conjecture that what we see for the solitons is sort of a shadow of an estimate which should hold for solutions of the flow itself, right? Um, and well, as as it's phrased, uh, remember the BCD estimate I wrote down before. It was a, it was a function of curvature minus a multiple of, of radius squared, that's not even uh, scaling invariant, for example. So that, that function itself cannot possibly work. Uh, you'd have to you know, somehow put in the scaling factors in the right way to make that work. And also the, the dependence on the origin has to be taken into account somehow. And there's many ways that you could vary that. And some of them seem to give you nice terms, but I haven't been able to find something that, that gives you a monotone functional for the flow. But that's really the sort of the big, uh, question here, turn the BCD estimate into uh, some kind of estimate for solutions of the parabolic flow rather than just the solitan equation. Uh, if you do that, then I think you'd be in good shape. That would give you, well, it would probably give you a way of showing that that, that solutions become spherical uh, without going through solitons as an intermediate step. It in particular, would give you a simpler proof of the, of the Gauss curvature case. Um, okay, so. I should point out the analogs of the BCD estimate are also known for many other flows, not just these ones. Um, so there's a whole bunch of authors who've, who've sort of pushed through those estimates to other flows. Uh, Shan Sekar, Hai Zhong Li, Hui Ma, Li Chen, and Xiao Feng Wang. Uh, so now, I mean, they certainly cover all of the flows I've been talking about involving uh, ratios of 
elementary fit symmetric tungstens, they all have, you know, we know that smooth strictly convex solitons are spheres. Um, but I should also point out that all of those flows also have these kind of lower dimensional generalized solitons. So the picture is, is probably, is certainly more complicated. Um, and let me just mention the strategy too, of course, is if we knew monotone functionals for some of these flows, in particular, let's say the EK to the alpha over K, then that would probably finish the story, right? So once we know that uh, there's a, some reason that limiting shapes should be solitons, then that would be enough to say that things become spheres from what we know about this. Yeah, uh, I think that's all I want to say here. Yeah, those, I just want to finish with those two conjectures about possible, what we can expect, yeah, possible good results for these flows. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Very interesting problems there. Um, are there any questions for Ben? Um, I might jump in with something just on that last bit. Is there, is there something known, or if not known, is there an obvious conjecture for the two-dimensional case? Is there anything general known um, without extra conditions when, when your surfaces, when you have surfaces in R3? Short answer is no. So I think if you can generalize the, if you can use the strategy one here, that probably is not two dimension dependent. Um, so if you can do it for n equals two, you can probably do it for higher dimensions too. Um, n equals two, as far as I know, doesn't give you any extra, uh, Sort of insight into the monotone functionals. I never have, you know, I, I don't see it, uh, any sort of particularly two dimensional candidates for, for monotone functionals that, uh, that you can cook up. Um, so, yeah, neither of these strategies seems to be particularly tied to or particularly helped by, by thinking about the two dimensional case. I mean, two dimensional case is really nice in, in understanding the, you know, the terms involving gradients of second and final form that come up. So, I mean, that's, that's really what made the fire conjecture argument um, work. You can understand all the terms that come up. But uh, yeah, things like finding the monotone, quant monotone functionals, I, I don't think it helps a great deal. Okay, thanks. I guess re replacing the inverse concave and zero on the boundary by n equals two is probably way too hopeful. Uh, yeah, I mean, this that, that condition is, it's sort of in some sense almost necessary. Yeah. Uh, but not really necessary in the sense that it should only it would only be needed on the boundary, right? Yeah. Uh, so in some sense, what you need, yeah, maybe a sharp condition. Again, sharp-ish condition is uh, you don't really need f star to be concave. What you need is that the restriction of f to any boundary face has concave dual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the two-dimensional case, that's trivial, right? So that every every flow will satisfy that. Okay. So that, right. in that sense, yeah, the, you can uh, you can dispose of that. Uh, in fact, so you don't actually need the concavity at all. You just need zero on the bound f star zero on the bound of the composite, composite cone would be enough in the two dimensional case. Yeah, yeah it would just be linear in, in the two dimensional case. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, I have a general question that's not strictly related to the talk, but I so Matt knows this, but I was I was recently asked by someone not in flows, um, sort of when you can sort of what are the what are the maximal conditions on which you can construct a convex foliation um so say you have a convex hypersurface in the manifold um so uh, I, I know by by your results and, and some other results uh, if it's convex enough then the, then some flow will contract to a round point mm -hmm. um but if you if you don't care that the flow doesn't in one go if you just want to construct a some sort of convex foliation. Um, sort of what's the broadest, I, I, if anyone knows sort of what, if there's a broader class or if there's a strategy there. There's a certain sense in which the harmonic mean curvature flow always does it if it can be done. Um, so if there exists a convex foliation, then the harmonic mean curvature flow will produce it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I mean, that's probably not quite true. There's certainly, if there exists a strictly convex foliation, then then the harmonic mean curvature flow will do that. It's probably it's not true if there's if you if the foliation has to go through weakly convex leaves, I guess. Uh, but if there's a, if there exists a strictly convex foliation starting from a given hypersurface, um, then the harmonic mean curvature flow will find one. Yeah. The shifted harmonic mean. Uh, if you're talking about convex, then just the harmonic mean. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. right. Uh, yeah. 
but that doesn't give you a nice condition in terms of the initial hypersets, right? It just says that the flow will find it if there is one. The yeah. if and only if condition is, uh, if there is a convex, fo uh, works, yeah. convex foliation, then harmonic mean curvature flow shrinks to a point in finite time and becomes round, mm -hmm. gives you a convex foliation. Yeah. Is your 94 result still sort of the best, best uh, uh, condition? I don't, well, I don't know of any work that sort of substantially changes that. Yeah, so there the condition is essentially, if you have uh, sec what is it? sectional curvatures, you know, bounded below by, let's say minus k squared, and your uh, principal curvatures are uh, greater than or equal to k or bigger than k, then you get uh, just a simple convergence to a round point, and uh, so obviously a convex foliation. Yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Thanks, Dr. Andrews, for the for the great talk. Uh, regarding your second uh, conjecture, I have a question. Uh, so yeah. maybe you address this at some point, but uh, like what in the like we we have several analysis techniques for alpha equals one, right? Well, what's exactly the thing that prevents those uh, analysis techniques from working when alpha is not one? Like, is it uh, the lack of knowledge of these monotone functionals, or like what exactly? Uh, uh, so the alpha equals one argument essentially works all by maximum principal arguments applied to you know suitable functions of curvature right? uh, for alpha bigger than one then it doesn't seem that those arguments can work right so i mean there's a few examples where it does work so you know the, the fiery conjecture in two dimensions for example but but uh i think okay let me get that straight so for example in, for the flows by gauss curvature to a power bigger than one in space n equals two i sort of have an almost proof that there are no monotone curvature functions which will give you control on the, uh, you know, give you convergence to a sphere. Right? So there just isn't any point-wise control on curvature which can prove it. The BCD estimate is sort of the next best thing in the sense that it, it will combine a control on curvature with something which depends on the, the position factor. So which is why I'm saying this, this strategy one is kind of what you're suggesting. I think that you would combine those those methods from the, the homogeneous degree one case with you know somehow incorporating this extra term uh, and so i think that is a good strategy yeah uh, and it would use you know the same kinds of ideas as we used in the alpha equals one case but then somehow incorporating the extra term yeah thank you i guess there's sort of a semi-obvious time factors you can introduce and i'm assuming that yes they don't seem to be quite enough um, yeah you can always just turn it into a homogeneous thing by by incorporating the, the appropriate powers of time well, for example, there's a there's the issue of, of somehow controlling what the final time is. Then are you factors of one over remaining time, uh, which you would need to control. Um, but also the translation dependence is problematic there. So, uh, you know, if you somehow choose things wrong, then you you'll definitely get things which are not monotone in the way that we're hoping to prove. So, mm -hmm. But there's many other ways you could, could modify these things by by including. Uh, Quantities which are constant on solid on solitons, yeah. Mm -hmm. Somehow in, including other other quantities of that form. Ben, did you say something about high co-dimension, or can you say anything about I, high co-dimension? I did mention them, but not anything useful. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, so uh, I, or, the only thing I said is that for, for high co-dimension, really the only good flow that we know is mean curvature flow, um, uh, in the sense that. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the evolution of second fundamental form in high co-dimension, the only flow where it really satisfies a reaction diffusion type equation, or you know, something with a leading term which is an elliptic operator, is uh, is the mean curvature flow. Yeah. You said you could rule out anything else in co-dimension two. Co-dimension two, yeah. You just go. You could, it's a sort of laborious computation where you write down the general form as right. a function of the second amount of you know. You know some flow uh, as a map from the second front of a form to the normal bundle yeah, yeah. and work out the algebraic it's, it's condition. The symbol, yeah, it's a, it's a condition on the, on the symbol. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't, didn't know that. It's just a gruesome algebraic computation. And you could do this in principle in higher co-dimension, but I was not brave enough to try that. Yeah. So, my, so my suspicion would be that parallel questions in for harmonic maps in yang Mills fields are probably equally. Yeah, equal. I think there might be some parallels there. Yeah, I... Um, so you have the harmonic, the, the Yang Mills flow, and but I think it would be hard to find other examples uh, which are well behaved. 
perhaps it's similar to the higher co-dimension case for mean curvature. Yeah, simply because it's inherently sort of a system rather than a scalar problem. I think you'll get similar yeah. things yeah. coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ben, for a great talk and for the, the open problems. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks. <laughs>